Hey, we're continuing a series today called The Blessed Life, The Blessed Life, and we're doing something with this series that we've never done before. We're receiving this message from Pastor Robert Morris and tuning in with other churches to receive this message, and and in this series, you're going to hear about money, but I want you to understand the reality that this isn't really just about money, and when the Bible talks about money, it's not really just about money, but there's a bigger issue. It's the issue of our heart. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So if you're new to church, maybe you're not a Christian, you hear this message tonight. Hey, you might be wondering, hey, they're talking about money. Why is everyone cool with that? Well, we realize that Jesus is actually talking about our heart. God cares about our heart, and he wants us to put him first in our heart. So this topic, it is important, and it's heavy, but it's because it speaks right to the heart. And so we know, we know that the Bible is the word of God. It is from God, it's truth, and it's for us. And the more we receive it open-hearted and apply it to our lives, the more blessed we are. So when we talk about being blessed in this series, yes, there is a blessing that God will pour out on your finances, but God wants your whole life to be blessed. And whenever you put God first in your life, you'll find that you're blessed. And so we're about to receive. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to just invite you to receive from the Lord tonight. He has a word for you, and it's going to bless you. Do you believe that? God, we thank you for your word. We believe that it's true and that it's for us, so we open our hearts to receive tonight. As your people, we want to learn. We want to grow. We want to please you with our lives, and we recognize that you want to bless our lives. So God, help us to trust you and help us to grow to be more like Jesus. We honor you, Lord. Amen. Well, I want to say welcome to all the campuses, and I want to say welcome to the churches that are joining us by simulcast. We welcome every weekend uh, gateway, but I'd like to just welcome them again. Can you welcome uh, 38 churches that are joining us by simulcast right now? So we're very grateful that you're here. And I want you to turn your Bibles to one passage of Scripture. We'll go through some others, but we'll just look at one, Exodus 13. We'll just go to one, uh, Exodus chapter 13. And uh, as you're getting to Exodus 13, let me just say this. This is, in my opinion, the most important message in the series. We're in the series called The Blessed Life, and this is probably the most important message in the series. The title of this message is The Principle of First. The Principle of First. And I want to make this statement. If God is first in your life, then everything will come into order. Now, I'm not saying you won't have difficulties or problems or go through struggles. Jesus said in this world you'll have tribulation. But would you rather go through tribulation with everything in order (laughs) or everything out of order? And hear me, if Jesus is first, if God's first, everything will come into order in your life. If he is not first, then nothing will come into order in your life. God has to be first for there to be order in your life. So I want to show you this principle because this principle is a principle that runs all through Scripture. From Genesis to Revelation. Here, So let's start Exodus chapter 13, look at verse 1. Says, then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. It is mine. It belongs to me. I wish that I could adequately explain to you how emphatic the language is in the Hebrew here. This phrase, it is mine. Mine. It is my property. It belongs to me. I'm the owner. It's extremely emphatic. It's very important to understand that when we talk about the principle of first. The firstborn, he says, belongs to me. Okay, now look at verse 12. That you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb. That is, every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have, the males shall be the Lord's, very similar language in the Hebrew, shall belong to God. They'll be the Lord's. But every firstborn, now we'll talk about this, of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. Very important. A donkey will be redeemed with a lamb. Now watch this phrase. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. 
It's very important to understand that if you don't redeem it, you're going to lose it anyway. And I want you to apply that as we talk about the first of our finances, the first 10%. He says, you're, if, you don't, if you don't bring it to me, you're going to lose it. You're still going to lose it. It's going out of your account. Watch this. And all the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. All right, so I have three points. If you're taking notes, I want you to write these down. The firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. Now, that's a longer point than I normally have, and so we'll make sure and leave it up long enough for you to be able to, to write it down. The firstborn must be. There, there, there is, there, the, I, I, I prayed over this language before, uh, whether I should say it this way. But according to Scripture, the firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. That's the principle here in the Old Testament that is referring to a principle that goes all through the Bible. The firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. Okay, but how do you know which to do? How do you know whether you sacrifice it or redeem it? Well, he gives two animals which are exemplary of categories of animals. He, he, he gives us the donkey and the lamb, okay? The donkey represents unclean animals, and the lamb represents clean animals, so how do you know which to do? Well, if it's a clean animal, it has to be sacrificed, the firstborn. If it's an unclean animal, it has to be redeemed with the sacrifice of a clean. Let me say that one more time. If it's clean firstborn, I'm hoping you kind of get ahead of me on this and understand what this represents. If it's a clean and it's firstborn, it has to be sacrificed. If it's unclean, it has to be redeemed with the sacrifice of a clean. Okay, well, how in the world does this relate to us today? Well, let me ask you two, two questions, all right? First of all, were you and I spiritually born clean or unclean? In other words, when we were born in the natural, our spiritual state before God, were we born into this world, were we clean or unclean? Unclean. We were all born in sin, right? I can prove it by simply asking the experts here, the parents, did you have to teach your children to be bad? <laughs> or did that come naturally for them? See, we have to teach them to be good. Is that right? Because we're all born with a sin nature. That's, that's what the Bible says, all right? So we were all born unclean. Was Jesus born unclean or clean? Clean. Okay, listen to me. Listen very carefully. The clean, Jesus, the clean had to be sacrificed so that the unclean could be redeemed. That's what we just read. That's how important this principle is. And we're going to see that this principle refers to tithing, but I want to say something to you that maybe you've never thought of. Jesus is God's tithe. Because you see, you give the tithe first. You don't pay your bills and see if you have enough left over to tithe. You give the tithe first. It's the first 10%. It's not just 10%. It's the first 10% because it takes faith to give the first. See, God said, when your sheep has a lamb, give me the first one. It takes faith to give the first one before you have any more. You don't know if the sheep's going to produce anymore. That takes faith. God didn't say, wait until your sheep has ten, and then give me one of them, and you can give me the one that keeps getting in your garden that you don't like. No, he said, you give me the first one before you have any others. See, so many people think it's not the ten percent that enacts the blessing, it's the faith that enacts the blessing. It's giving the first 10%. And the reason I say that Jesus is God's tithe is because God gave Jesus first. He didn't wait to see if we would clean up or straighten up to give his son. God gave Jesus when we were mocking him and spitting on him and nailing him to a cross. Romans says it this way, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Romans also said this way, that God gave Jesus in hope, in hope. And that word, the root of that word is faith. In faith, we give our tithe in faith. 
So it's the first 10%. Think about this. When the children of Israel went into the, the uh, promised land, God said, bring all of the silver and gold from Jericho into the house of God. It's always into the house of God. That's always where the tithe goes. But why didn't he say 10% of Jericho? Hey, it's very simple. Because Jericho was the first city. That's simple. He said, bring the first into the house of the Lord and the rest are redeemed. They're out from under the curse. They're blessed. See, the first portion has the redemptive, is the redemptive portion. The, please hear me. When you give the first to God, the rest are redeemed. That's what this is saying. So hear me clearly. <laughs> Don't give the first portion to the mortgage company because the mortgage company does not have the power to bless your finances. But God does. The first portion, first 10%, goes to God. So the firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. Here's the second point. The first fruits must be offered. Again, I want to just key in on these words, must be. According to this principle that works all through Scripture, the first fruits must be Offered. You can stay there in Exodus 13. Look at Proverbs 3, verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. Bonuses, everything. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Okay, this says to honor the Lord with the first of our increase. I just want to just make a note here. This is in Proverbs. This is not the law. This is not under the law. This is hundreds of years after the law. This is a principle that runs all through Scripture. Let me show you another Scripture, Exodus 23, 19. The first of the first fruits. I kind of like that phrase because it's like God is saying, listen closely if you don't know what first means. <laughs> the first of your first fruits, of the first fruits of your land. Now watch these words. You shall bring... That's an important word, bring into the house of the Lord your God. Now, we, we saw last weekend about Malachi, he said, bring the tithes into the storehouse. The tithe always comes to the, to the church. You, don't, you can't divide your tithe. You can't designate your tithe. You can't give it somewhere else. But I want you to notice the word bring. The reason God uses the word bring instead of the word give when he talks about tithing is because you can't give what doesn't belong to you. You have two choices according to Scripture. And I know this is strong, but I've studied this for over 30 years now. You have two choices when it comes to the tithe according to Scripture. You can bring it or you can steal it. Those are the only two choices. There's no other choice according to Scripture. They either brought it or they stole it. Remember when God said, bring all the silver and gold from Jericho? That Achan kept some. And, of course, the next city, then they lost the battle until they brought it to the house of God. But here was the point. In, in Joshua chapter 6, God calls the tithe consecrated or set apart. Same thing he called the firstborn. But in Joshua 7, once Achan took it, he said, Israel has stolen from me, and they're cursed. They're cursed. It's consecrated when you bring it to the house of God. It's cursed if you leave it in your bank account. Here's a real simple, straightforward question. Why would you want something cursed in your bank account? I mean, it has enough problems. <laughs> Why wouldn't you want your bank account blessed? See, it takes faith to give the first. It takes faith to believe that 90% redeemed and blessed will go farther than 100% cursed. It takes faith. So you give the first. Um, uh, when I was in college, one of the uh, students asked one of the professors, why did God accept Abel's offering and he didn't accept Cain's? And the professor said, you know, I really don't know. And for some reason, I've always remembered that. But when the Lord showed me this principle of firstborn and first fruits, it's you actually will see why God accepted Abel's and he didn't accept Cain's. Watch Genesis 4, verses 3 through 5. And in the process of time, now those words are very important. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Notice it specifically does not say that he brought first fruits. He just brought an offering in the process of time. 
Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected, or this word could be received, Abel and his offering. Notice the persons received too, not just the offering. But he did not respect or receive Cain and his offering. It's, it's simple, isn't it? Cain was a farmer. He didn't bring first fruits. Abel was a rancher. He brought firstborn. God said, I'll accept that. I will not accept that. Then accept it. Now, I'm going to take you a little farther in this, and that is that it's not just that God wouldn't accept it. It's that God couldn't accept it. There are some things God can't do. God can't act outside of himself. He can't act outside of his character. One of the greatest studies you could ever do would be the attributes of God, to know who God really is. Okay, so let me, let me tell you a, a few things that God can't do. Uh, number one, God can't change. He can't change. This is called the immutability. This would be the doctrinal theological word, the immutability of God. It's impossible for God to change. The reason God can't change is because if God could change, he could get better, and God can't get better because he's perfect. So God can't change. Uh, the second thing God can't do, I'll just give you, give you some examples, is that God can't think the way we think. Now, I clarify that because we know the Bible talks about the thoughts of God, but that actually proves this theology. God can't think the way we think. Let me just, just uh, help us with this. Um, we, the reason God can't think the way we think is because this is, here's the theological word, omniscient. Yeah. Omniscience, the omniscience of God. Break it down, it's two words, omni-science. Science means knowledge, omni means all. God has all knowledge. So the reason God can't think the way we think is because we think to figure things out. God's not trying to figure anything out. Let, let me say it another way when we're talking about God's thoughts. Nothing has ever occurred to God. God has never said, you know what I just thought of? I just thought of something I've never thought of before. He's never said that. You know why? Because he knows everything at the same time. Hey, I have a, a new little thought on this. Uh, when we talk about that God, nothing's ever occurred to God, let me, let me say it another way. God has never heard something and said, oh, my self. I mean, he wouldn't say, oh, my God. He'd say, oh, my. Okay, all right. So, <clears throat> so God, God can't think the way we think. Now, when I said God can't think, you might have remembered a scripture and thought, wait, there's a scripture that talks about, uh-huh, that proves this. Here's what the scripture says in Isaiah. My thoughts are not your thoughts. I don't think the way you think. As the heavens are above the earth, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. I don't think the way you think. That's what he's saying. Okay, so there's some things God can't do. Let me tell you how this relates to this. God can't be second. He can't be second. This is called the preeminence of God. You know, you've heard of eminence, but God is preeminent. That means he's not only first of all, he's before all. He's higher than all. He's above all. He's first. He's before all. So God is first. Now, we, we, in our lives, we talk about putting God first, and that's good because we do need to put God first in our lives. But I just want you to know something. Even if God's not first in your life, he's still first. That's right. You didn't rearrange his order in the universe. He's still preeminent. So God can never be second. So this is why I'm telling you, the reason God couldn't accept Cain's offering is because God's always first, and Cain did not bring a first offering. God said, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't accept a second place offering because I'm always in first place. I can't accept it. Now, we need to think about that when it comes to the tithe. You remember uh, I said Jesus is God's tithe? And I said to you last weekend, because we talked about giving to, to the bride of Christ, and I said that tithing is probably more personal to Jesus than what we think. Okay, I want you to think about this. If Jesus is God's tithe, Tithing might be a little more personal to the Father also than what we think. See, it represents who's first in your life. You, you can, and I'm, again, I know these, some of the things I'm saying are strong, but you can tell me all day God's first in your life, 
But let me see your bank account. Now, I'll tell you who's first. It might be Nordstrom's. Okay, ladies, let me hit the guys. It might be Bass Pro Shops. <laughs> Where does the first 10% go? That's who's first. All right, so the firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. The first fruits must be offered. Here's point three. The tithe must be first. The tithe must be first. Leviticus 27, 30 says, and all, I want you to notice the word all, and all the tithe of the land, all of it, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. There's the emphatic phrase again, belongs to God. It is, it, God set it apart for himself. And that's what the next phrase says. It is holy. That word holy is the word that simply means set apart. It is set apart to the Lord. That's why it's stealing, because he set it apart to himself. And that's why it has to be first, because God's first and he owns it. So in, order, in other words, if we're going to return it, we have to return it first. Okay, so I'm going I'm to give you an illustration, um, and it's a math illustration, okay? So I'm warning you, so half of you can take a nap, all right? Um, I understand that. You're, you're strong in other subjects, math and English. I'm strong in those subjects. Uh, you know, I, I like gr grammar, you know, and uh, someone who watches our television program sent me a, a thing that said, I am a little sign for me to hang up my house that said, I am silently correcting your grammar right now. And I said to Debbie, I said, look at this. Do you like this? She said, yeah, except uh, you don't do it silently. <laughs> so I like math and English. My father is actually a mathematical genius. And that's no exaggeration. He's a genius when it comes to that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a genius, but numbers add up in my mind without me trying. If you, if you name some numbers, they're going to add up, and I'm, I'm not going to try to do it. It's just going to happen. That's the way I think. Um, we, we were, Debbie and I were buying something a while back, and it was $7.99. And the lady said, uh, I'll have to add the tax on the uh, calculator because the cash register's broken. And I said, it's 66 cents, like that. And she said, excuse me? I said, 66 cents. She looked at her a minute, and then she did this. She said, uh, it's 66 cents. <laughs> I won't say, yes, I know that. But I did. I said, okay, so paid for it. We got out in the car, and Debbie said to me, how do you do that? How, how do you do that that fast? Now, I thought she was actually asking me how I did it. <laughs> I found out later she couldn't care less how I did that. She was just, you know, paying me a compliment as a, a wife honoring her husband. But she asked, how do you do that? So I said, well, sugar, uh, 7.99 is close to 8. Our tax rate is 8.25. 8 times 8 is 64. Quarter of 8 is 2. 64 plus 2 is 66. I said, that should happen in less than a second in your mind. <laughs> she said, it doesn't. <laughs> then she said, but I know what 25% off is. <laughs> so again, now being the man, you know, I, I'm thinking she's talking math. I did not realize till after the whole conversation she was not talking math. But I said to her, okay, if you're buying something for $100 and it's 25% off, I said, what does that mean? She said, it means it's a good deal. <laughs> and then she said, and if it's 50% off, it's free. I said, what? She said, yeah, 50% off is the same thing as buy one, get one free. So it's free. There's 50% off, it's free. And if it's 75% off, you're making money. Which explains some difficulties we've had over the years with our checkbook. I saved us money today. You ever heard that one? <laughs> well, how come we lost? Okay, so, um, so I'm going to give you a math illustration, and so half of you can check out, all right, just for a moment. It's not a, a tough one either, right? Let's say that you're a landscaper, and you uh, come to our home, and Pastor Albert, um, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I call you, and I say, listen, uh, I'd like to add some trees and some plants and some... Okay, let me make this uh, illustration realistic. 
Debbie would like to add some plants and some trees and some flowers and things, you know. And so you give me an estimate. You say, now this is how much my materials will be. This is how much my labor it will be. And my profit will be $1,000. You need to know the tithe is on the profit. It's not on all of this. It's on the increase, your personal increase, personal income. That's what we tithe on, okay? So um, so you say, are you agreeable to this whole price? I say, yes, I am. So after you do the job, I pay for all your materials, all your labors. And then for your profit, let's say that I give you 10 $100 bills. So you have $1,000 in your hand, okay? So this is the math part, right? So you have $1,000. Let me ask you two questions, all right? $1,000, the word tithe, remember, means 10%. So how much is the tithe? $100, all right? I know some of you still okay, carry the, okay. But that's all right, that's okay. All right, so it's $100, that's right. But you have $1,000 bills in your hand, so which one is the tithe? The first one. Yeah, okay. The one on top, someone said. All right, let me say it to you a different way, all right? It's the first one that leaves your hand. That's the tithe. In other words, if you go home and you say, let me set aside some for the mortgage, some for the car, some for utility, some for clothes, and here's God's part. No, that's not God's part. You gave God's part to the mortgage company. Because here's what a lot of people do. Okay, let me set aside some for this and this and this, and oh, there's not enough leftover for God. Can I say something nicely to you, but firmly? He wouldn't accept it anyway, because our God does not accept leftovers. Matter of fact, he says it in Malachi. He says, you bring me the blind and the, and the lame animals, and I do not accept them. I accept the first. That's all I accept. Okay, so how, how does this work out in my own life? I get paid on the 15th and 30th. And, uh, or the last day of the month, 30th or 31st, and it's directly deposited. So it's like it magically appears, you know, on my account. So what I do on the 15th and the last day of the month is while I'm having my quiet time in the morning, before I do anything else, I go online, and, and that's the way now. I think it's just easiest to give online. I go online, and I uh, send the tithe to Gateway Church. And for us, many of you know, it's a double tithe. It's been since 1985. God spoke just to do 20% to the local church and then give over and above that. So for us, it goes to, and what we do, by the way, is to, you know, 10% is the tithe. We have 10% extra to heart for the kingdom every year. So that's how we can kind of estimate it when we come to that part of the, of the year, which will be in, in a few months, we'll come to that part where we all get to make a commitment over and above our tithe. So we, I send that on the 15th and the 30th. Okay. So what happens though, if I, I, I have an early morning meeting and, um, I kind of rush out, I don't have my quiet time that day and I get home that night and I think, Oh, it's the 15th. I, I forgot to do the tithe. And I go in and I notice that Debbie has been to the grocery store that day. Okay. What I do, I don't say, Oh, it's great sugar. We're cursed. <laughs> It's great. I mean, you gave the tithe to Kroger's, and so we're cursed now. No, because I'm not legalistic about it. And listen to me, God's not legalistic either. I'm not trying to give you a legalistic principle today. I'm trying to give you a principle that's about your heart. Where's your heart? God knows my heart, and he knows your heart. Where's your heart? So the first 10% goes to the house of God. Now, Exodus 13, let me show you one more scripture, and, and then we're finished, all right? We stopped a while ago at verse 13, so let's pick it up at verse 14. So it shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, what is this? Okay, in other words, he's saying one day your son's going to ask you, why are you killing these animals? That you shall say to him, by strength of hand, by a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And it came to pass when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go that the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all males that open the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. Okay, I want you to, let's just bring this up to modern day. Let's think about this. The son uh, goes away to college. He gets his degree. He comes back. His dad says, hey, one of the things I like you to do is take over the books. And so one day the son is sitting in there and he's got the books in front of him. Dad comes in from the field and the son says, uh, Dad, um, uh, sit, sit down, Dad. Uh, you know, you asked me to, you know, take over the books and uh, the business and all. And Dad, I'm, 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 I've been going over the books. And um, Dad, um, I, want, I want to talk to you about something, man. Um, 
you might not even know you do this. You know, Dad, uh, we all have blind spots, you know, so not accusing you, just just talking numbers now. Um, but, Dad, um, every time uh, one of our animals has a, a firstborn, you, um, how shall I say this, uh, kill it. <laughs> and, uh, Dad, uh, I think it's getting out of hand uh, with you because you, you, you killed 72 animals last year. And um, um, we're, we're in the ranching business, Dad. And uh, th- th- this is cutting into our profits. So wh- wh- why do you do that? He said, one day your son's going to ask you. And he said, when he asks you, you say to your son, son, um, I need to tell you something about our family that you don't know. But we weren't always in the ranching business. We, we did not own animals. We didn't own land. Son, we were slaves. We were in bondage. But God, with a mighty hand, redeemed us and gave us everything we have now. Therefore, we gladly give to God the firstborn of all of our increase. Now, this was written 4,000 years ago. And this principle happened to me. Uh, When Josh was kind of getting old enough to understand numbers and all, and he has this mathematical mind like I do and like his grandfather. And so one day I was paying the bills. Now, we didn't have online back then. And so what I would do is I would write the check first. And then I would set the check, the tithe check, and then I would set it over the side, and then I would pay the bills. But I'd always write the tithe check first and set it over the side and then take it with me to church. By the way, for you young people, we used to have pieces of paper called checks. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I'd set it over the side. So I'm paying the bills, and Josh came in, and I'm watching him out of the corner of my eye. And he's reading this tithe check, and he sees the amount which to a, a young boy looks like a lot of money. And he says, Dad, why are you giving so much to the church? And I remember this scripture, when your son asks you, this is what you tell him. And I took Josh and I actually set him on my lap and I said to him, I need to tell you something about daddy that you don't know. But daddy wasn't always a Christian, son. And daddy was a very bad man. And daddy was in bondage. But God with a mighty hand redeemed your daddy and gave us everything we have now. Therefore, I gladly give to God the first of all of my increase. This is a principle that's all through scripture. It's called the principle of first. Is God first in your life? Amen. That's good, right? The principle of first. If you put God first, the rest will be blessed. If God is not first, the rest will never be in the right order. This is a principle that if you will apply to your life, will completely change your life. This is why we're teaching this series. This is why we're having this conversation. It's not because the church needs extra money to pay the electric bill, and we need everyone to get together, right? It's because God wants your life to be blessed, and I want your life to be blessed. God does not want you to miss out on this kind of blessing in your life. So this message today, I really pray that it will encourage you. Some of you, you had no idea that this was a thing. 
Uh, we have a lot of Christians in our church. They're just learning every week. They just got saved. They're still learning a lot of this. I didn't even know about this until just a couple of weeks ago. And, and now they're applying these principles to their lives, and they're experiencing God's blessing in their lives already. I'm going to share a couple of testimonies with you. I didn't share this with the AM crowd, but when you come to the PM, you get bonus content. Amen? Yeah. Praise Jesus. Here's one testimony that I shared on Facebook that, that Sally shared. She said, God is so good. I decided to put my total trust in God with my finances and started tithing last week. We were trying to buy a new house to be closer to my work and church. We found out today that we are getting the house and totally to my surprise, I got a rather significant pay raise at work too. Now that is a God thing. Thank you, Jesus. That's a great, so good. And Sally's in this service too. She's a real person, okay? You can validate this this testimony. So congratulations, but God's faithful. I hear testimonies like this all the time. Now let me explain how the principle of first works because someone's probably sitting here right now and they're thinking, man, that sounds so good, but I couldn't do that. My bills, I'm thinking through the numbers in my head and there's just not enough room left over at the end of the month. Listen, you can never not afford to put God first. It's impossible. When you decide that God is first, he's always first. There's always enough for him when he's first. So here's what you do. Here's how you do this. Here's how you take it home. You go home and you say, God, from now on, you are first. After you, everyone else gets bumped down a notch. Once I bring you the tithe, because it's really the options, remember, bring it or steal it. Once I bring you the tithe, then I will pay the mortgage and pay the utilities and pay for food. And then I'm going to get into the accessories and the things that are nice to have. And, and if God's first, I'm going to trust you to work out the rest. I'm going to put you first. I'm going to trust you and believe that 90% with your blessing will go further than 100% on my own. Now, let me tell you another testimony of how someone else put this into practice in their life. And with that mindset, a guy named Russ shared this testimony with me after the 11 a.m. service. He said, I went home last week. I'm going to tithe. I'm going to do it. God is first, and I will trust him to work out the difference. So he said, I hadn't yet paid my car insurance payment. I was putting it off because I'm still in this zone where I'm like, I'm trusting God to come through. Put God first. Trust him to come through. And so he said, what I did is I called up the insurance company, and I was like, listen, don't cancel my insurance yet. Uh, here's where I'm at. I'm doing this thing with God, so just hang tight. <laughs> right? Talk about trust. Here's what they said to him. They said, uh, sir... Uh, you're actually not late on your payment, right? Get this. They said, there was an adjustment to your insurance. Your account actually has credits. Your insurance was lowered. And then, no, wait, it gets better. It gets better. And then they said, we changed our processing company. And so your next payment isn't even due till next month. You put God first. You trust him to work out the rest, and he will always come through. He will always come. I hear testimonies like this every week. You know what testimony I've never heard? Yeah, I'm homeless because I tithe too much. <laughs> Shouldn't have got so carried away with that whole God first thing. Never heard that one. But I do hear people say, I just can't afford it. I just can't afford it. And they never get ahead. They're never experiencing God's blessing in their lives. I just want to encourage you, just trust. Yes. It's a faith thing. It takes faith to put God first and trust him to work out the rest. And you'll find that God, he is faithful. He is so good to us. He's so good, he proved his goodness by giving his son Jesus first. He gave Jesus first, hoping in faith that we would accept Jesus. Right, we just heard that. God did not wait until we got our act together in order to send Jesus. That's human, lo human logic, that's what we would do. But God said, I love you so much, I'm going to send Jesus first while you're still in rebellion against me, hoping that you'll accept this gift of salvation. That proves to you how much God loves you. Are you wondering if God loves me? The answer is yes. Jesus is the proof that God loves you. And not just you as a church, but you individually. God loves you so much that he sent his only son to die in your place on the cross, to pay a debt for your sins so that you could be free and forgiven. That is amazing love, right? Never forget how much God loves you. And I'm believing that you'll experience this more and more the longer that you walk with Jesus. Life with Jesus, doing it God's way, is always infinitely better than doing it my way. 
Right? How many of you remember these days, right? Before you met God, even on your best day, there was still a sense of dissatisfaction. Even on your best day, there was a sense of, I need more. It's not enough. This doesn't numb the pain. This isn't good enough. There's still a void. And then you found Jesus, and then you found hope, you found love. Doesn't mean that it's always easy, but you found out, even on my worst day, there's peace, there's hope, there's love, there's satisfaction, there's contentment, because when you do it God's way, it's blessed. It's blessed. So God wants you to experience this kind of blessing in your life. And I'm praying that you will. I'm praying some of you, you're like, I didn't even know about this till now. Yeah, God's going to really do amazing things in your life. Some of you, you're saying, oh, I've been wrestling with this for a while, and I just needed this push today. I needed this encouragement. I needed this challenge. Just get ready for God to blow your mind. Some of you are already doing this. You're already putting it into practice. You need to be reminded why you do this, and you need to be encouraged. Hey, this is why you're so blessed. Don't ever forget. Don't forget why. It's because of God's faithfulness and favor in your life. So don't let this become just a ritual thing, a habit. Always remember, God is first. I'm worshiping him because he's good to me, because of what he's done for me. So I'm going to pray for you in a moment. And those of you who are praying for more faith to grow in this area and trust God, because this is the kind of message that if you love God, your heart cannot help but respond to it and say, I want that. I want God first in everything. But let's be honest, there's still a point where you can wrestle with faith. You can wrestle with fear, but what if there's fear and I might not have enough? So we got to pray for faith. It's okay to pray for God to give you more faith. And I know that as you walk in faith, God will prove himself to you and your faith will grow. Your life will be blessed. So let's pray first. Let's bow our heads. God, I thank you for showing us the truth in love because you love us and want us to be blessed. Lord, as your people, we receive it. We want to apply it to our lives. God, we know that your way is so much higher than our way. It's so much better than the way that we've tried on our own. Lord, so thank you for leading us into blessing. God, I pray for anyone who's here right now who is asking for more faith. They're saying, Lord, I, I want to obey. I want to put you first, but I struggle with faith. God, I have faith, but I need more faith. Lord, would you increase their faith? right now in Jesus name. Just expand it, increase it, fill them up, help them to take that next step. And Lord, you said to test you that you'll prove yourself to us. I'm praying for you to do it again in his and her life right now, God. We're testing you as you said, and you're going to come through. We believe it in Jesus name. We thank you in advance for the next wave of testimonies that we're going to hear after this weekend, Lord. You're so faithful. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just keep our head bowed. Maybe you're here and you say, I need to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I need to have a relationship with him. And listen, you'll never experience blessing in your life until you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And so maybe you're saying, hey, I need to accept him. You need to hear this message. If you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins so that you could be forgiven, if you believe that God raised him again from the grave, then you will be saved. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you believe it in faith, you will be saved. It is a gift of God. It's nothing that has to do with what we do. So we can't boast about it. We didn't earn it or deserve it. It's a gift we received by God's grace because he loves us and we do it by believing, by trusting, God, you're in control. God, you're the only solution. God, you're the answer. My hope is only in you. I'm gonna trust you to save me. I recognize I can't save myself. Tonight's someone's night to take that step of faith and accept Jesus and say yes. So if that's you, if you're ready tonight, I'm just gonna lead you in a prayer and I'm gonna invite you to say this prayer with me. Uh, just express what's in your heart. And if you mean it, God will hear it and you'll be changed. God, I pray for your help. I know that I've sinned and I need your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and I believe that he rose again. I accept him as my Lord and as my King. Lord, thank you for never giving up on me. I give you my life. I want to honor you with my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God's good, right? God is so good.
Hey, listen, we always celebrate this. If you just prayed that prayer with me and accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that's the most important moment that will happen in your entire life. So I want to celebrate that with you. Um, we're not going to embarrass you, but if you just pray that prayer, just wherever you're at so I can see, just slip your hand up real quick and raise it up for me to see so I can celebrate with you. we got one little guy. Anybody? That's awesome in the back. Okay, thank you. That's so good. Anyone else? Thank you. That's great, man. Awesome. Never ceases to amaze me. Whenever we talk about a subject like this, people still respond and say, I want to give my heart to Jesus. I just got to say, if you give your heart to Jesus after a sermon about tithing, you got extra saved. (laughs) You know that's genuine, right? (laughs) Come on. I'm so excited for you.